Good afternoon and welcome to the North American Vascular Biology Organization sixth webinar. I'm Linda Shapiro from the University of Connecticut and I'll be moderating today's session. We're pleased to welcome our speaker, Nathan Salomonis, Assistant Professor of Biomedical Informatics at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, who will present his work entitled Fast Interactive Genomics Data Visualization in Alt Analyze. This pr presentation presents a new technology and the protocols associated with it. We hope you find it inf this informative and helpful, and please share your, inter your feedback on the evaluation form. Before we get started, I wanted to go over some logistical aspects. Throughout this webinar, you're able to switch between the phone audio and computer audio in case you're having a problem with either one. You can see this information on the audio section of the GoToWebinar control panel. If you experience technical problems, please click on the tab at the top of the control panel. Scroll to the bottom of the help screen for the technical support phone number. At this time, I'd also like to welcome Mina Venkata Subramanian, also from the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, who will be the monitor or will be monitoring today's questions. Questions will be handled in two ways. Throughout the presentation, you can type your questions into the question box on the control panel. Mina will compile your questions and then direct them to Dr. Salomonis as they're posed or save them to the end of the presentation, whichever is appropriate. At the end of the question and answer period, provided there is time, attendees will be able to ask any additional questions. Uh, it, and if you can just type them once again into the question box, um, you know, I'll answer them or, or pose them to Dr. Salomonis. Um, this webinar is being recorded and archived in the NAVBA website for future use. Dr. Salomonis is an assistant professor of biomedical informatics at Cincinnati Children's. Dr. Salomonis and his group are on the cutting edge of developing new software and algorithms to identify complex functional relationships from whole transcriptome data. They've developed several open source analysis tools, including Alt Analyze, Lineage Profiler, Go Elite, and Net Perspective. Links to these tools were provided to you in your registration confirmation. With the onslaught of new approaches to measure genomic states, including single cell genomics and alternative splicing, accessible tools for data visualization and analysis are required by both bioinformatics and non-computational bio biologists alike. In this webinar, we'll walk through the various tools within the software I'll analyze, pre-compiled from Mac and Windows to visualize genomics data sets. In particular, we'll learn to apply approaches for hierarchical clustering, pathway visualization, dimensionality reduction, and network analysis. The goal of this webinar is to have you immediately use these techniques to visualize and analyze your own data. The software can be found at http www.altanalyze.org. We recommend you download, extract, and follow the instructions for downloading the species databases before the webinar or right now. However, you're also welcome to do it afterwards. For issues, contact altanalyze at gmail.com. Last year, the Salomonis Lab worked collaboratively with a dozen investigative research teams within Cincinnati Children's to develop new methods for evaluating whole gen genome transcriptome data sets. These methods include the detection of distinct gene and splicing populations from bulk and single cell genome profiles, predicting implicated cell types present in complex fetal maternal biological samples, and identifying new disease regulatory networks related to pediatric and adult cancers, cardiovascular disease, and spinal cord injury. Welcome, Dr. Salomonis, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Linda, very much. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes. Uh, great. Um, so uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Actually, there's not much more I need to add to that. Um, the, today, really, what we are wanting to focus on is enabling uh, folks that uh, do not have computational uh, expertise or background to visualize their own uh, genomics data uh, using a variety of different um, portable methods. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on a toolkit, Alt Analyze, which my group has been developing for, for quite a bit, quite a while now. I actually started developing Alt Analyze as a, a graduate student 
uh, in 2010, which was uh, the first release was in 2008. So it's we've been actually working on this uh, package for a long time, um, or this toolkit for a while. So uh, as as Linda mentioned, um, if you uh, haven't downloaded Alt Analyze uh, already, you you're welcome to do so. Although I'd recommend that you probably just if you haven't downloaded it yet to actually just uh, watch the tutorial and follow along for now. And uh, if you can watch this again later, that would be great uh, to review some of these things. It's fairly fast to download Alt Analyze. It, it usually takes a couple of minutes. Sometimes SourceForge is uh, a bit slower, but depending on what what uh, uh, downloader it's it's uh, what what website it's uh, connected to. Um, but the database actually often takes about 10 minutes to download within Alt Analyze. Um, however, I'll I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, but for reference, uh, if you go to the Alt Analyze website, which you can see here at the top, which is uh, altanalyze.org, um, that you'll see that there's a lot of background information, tutorials. Actually, there are web web tutorials, video tutorials. Uh, there are vignettes that walk through each of the analyses, which I'm going to go through today. Uh, and the software itself can be downloaded as pre-compiled versions for Mac, Windows, uh, and you can also download the source code versions of this, and this all open, all free and open source, uh, and you're you're welcome to reuse and even modify if you wish. So, so the analyses that we're going to actually cover today are are going to be focused on data visualization, which I really think is, uh, you know, one of these, uh, uh, you know, the, these difficult things for most biologists to do, even if they have genomics data analyzed. Uh, you know, processing sometimes genomic data is not the hardest part in finding, um, you know, differences within um, within populations uh, is is actually is often straightforward depending on the tools that you're using. And AltAnalyze actually performs a large number of those analyses, which we're not going to be going into depth today. Uh, but one of the bigger challenges is actually understanding what your data means. And to do that, you really need to use a number of downstream analysis tools. Uh, so with that in mind, we're going to be focusing today on simple and advanced methods uh, for data visualization, including hierarchical clustering, uh, methods for dimensionality reduction, such as PCA, uh, and interactive visualization of those data, um, visualizing your gene expression changes on biological pathways, in particular wiki pathways, uh, deriving actual protein gene networks or protein-protein interaction networks when you perhaps don't have a good reference pathway uh, for your particular experiment, how you compare data, uh, data sets, uh, including differentially expressed genes from different comparisons with a Venn diagram, for example, and how you even understand what the cell type uh, composition that might underlie uh, your bulk or even potentially a single cell RNA-seq sample. Um, so, so I don't expect everybody to know what, what all these methods are, and that's why we're actually gonna step through them a bit more in detail right now as a little bit of background before we delve into the software and show you how to, to perform these analyses. So, so many of you have probably, most all of you have heard of hierarchical clustering in biology, and you've probably all seen heat maps uh, represented in, uh, in papers, or you've generated them yourselves. Uh, what is a heat map or hierarchical clustering? It's, it's a method to group similar samples, cells, or genes together uh, based on common patterns of expression. Uh, here I'm saying cells or genes uh, because we're dealing with biological systems, but you can really apply hyperclustering to any kinds of data. Um, typically, the columns are samples or cells, and the rows are genes. Um, they don't have to be genes. They could be other uh, types of molecular entities that you're looking at, um, but the same kinds of clustering algorithms are applied to the columns and to the rows, typically, um, to organize those, those, those entities into different clusters. How does it work? Uh, typically, there are two types of ways that, that clustering is performed. There's actually many types of ways that clustering is performed, but the general common methods are agglomeration. And with agglomeration, what you're doing is you're, you're looking at each and every pair of, for example, uh, cells in your data set or samples and seeing what their general, their similarity are. And you're building, uh, you're building up relationships uh, from those pairs of relationships into larger clusters of relationships. And that's how you usually see it, uh, what results in what's, uh, what's known as a dendrogram uh, within uh, a tree of relationships when you're generating a hierarchically clustered result. There are also a different set of metrics which are um, uh, uh, really difference-based. Uh, uh, or um, uh, so, so they actually, so um, where you can actually split clusters. And so you effectively initially find some similarity between large groups of samples. 
And then, um, and then there are methods that are, I'm sorry, divisive methods. And so these divisive methods then split the data into smaller and smaller groups. Um, but typically, agglomerative methods are used most commonly. This is an example of uh, hierarchical clustering of a single data set with different algorithms. Uh, on the left is a standard hierarchical clustering approach where the genes have been clustered. Uh, so each row is a different gene. And you can see on the left, far left, there's a dendrogram those little lines which indicate the relationship between the genes, the similarity of genes to each other, uh, using a method called uh, cosine average. Um, and on the right is a different algorithm, which is a much more complex algorithm called HOPAC, which uses a somewhat different algorithm uh, to, uh, to find relationships between uh, genes in this case. And so you can get qualitatively different results from different clustering algorithms, as we'll show you later. Um, uh, dimensionality reduction. And so dimensionality reduction often refers to approach called principal component analysis, but it's a, it's a larger class of algorithms. And the goal with these methods is to really identify the ma major variance within your data set, uh, um, usually among all samples. So can you organize samples into effectively clusters uh, which are related to each other in a, a two-dimensional or three-dimensional space? Uh, you can visualize these results uh, using a scatter plot, and the scatter plot can either be shown in two dimensions or it can be rotated in three dimensions. Um, and each one of those axes, uh, three axes from the principal component plot, indicate uh, the uh, different types of variance within your data sets. For example, the first principal component may represent gender differences, and the second principal component may represent um, differences in immune cells within samples. Um, there, uh, with, uh, with each principal component, the genes, if you're looking at biological data, gene expression data, uh, genes are actually ranked within each of those pr principal components, uh, effectively saying that this gene is uh, contributing greater to this principal component than these other genes. So they're effectively ranked uh, positively to negatively. And you can, there are ways to access that information. There are other dimensionality reduction approaches such as T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, which is a long-term word term that you've probably heard before as T-SNE T -SNE plots. These are commonly used in single cell RNA sequencing analyses. This is a machine learning approach, and, and this approach is also available in the software Alt Analyze. Um, there are other, uh, this is an example of uh, a visualization, a 3D visualization plot for, uh, these are actually bulk RNA-seq samples collected from uh, pluripotent stem cells and other differentiated project products. And you can see that the colored balls represent um, basically different samples and their relationship to each other within uh, the first, the, 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 um, the variance associated with these top three principal components. Uh, there are other way, forms of visualization which are common to uh, uh, gen uh, genomics and biology, in particular pathway visualization, uh, a pathway uh, can mean different things. It can be a, and can actually be something analogous to a network. It can be a textbook pathway, like a biochemical pathway. It can be genes that are clustered, as you can see here at the top, uh, uh, into different uh, groups based on some prior annotation or prior information. Um, and you can color these uh, biological pathways often based on uh, data that you have. So in this case, these are full changes based on gene expression data, where red indicates upregulation and blue. Uh, indicates down regulation in a, in a data set comparison. On the bottom, you see the and, and a different type of biological gene representation, which is a network, uh, where here you have relationships between genes and proteins. And again, you can color the nodes or these circles based on their differential expression. In this case, it's they're not covered, colored red or blue based on their differential expression. Uh, and you have different types of arrows that have different meanings. So for example, a red arrow in this context actually is indicating transcriptional regulation. It does not indicate whether it's a promoting gene expression or repressing gene expression. It, it indicates that there's a, a regular, predicted regulatory interaction, in this case from ChIP-seq data. There are uh, other simple forms of, of representing data, for example, comparing different lists um, of genes in terms of which genes overlap between which different sets. In this case, this is a Venn diagram looking at the overlap of which genes are present uh, in different, different, different sets of differentially expressed regulated genes um, from different comparisons. And you can see it's a weighted VIN. So the, the, the size of the overlaps indicates how many genes are overlapping. 
And there are other forms of ways to represent this data, including um, predicting cell type composition. And in this case, you effectively have a lineage map, uh, a list of possible cell types and tissue types. And then you have a sample which has been analyzed, in this case, a pluripotent uh, RNA-seq from a pluripotent stem cell. And the software is predicting what it's likely composition is based on uh, its similarity to reference profiles. So all of these different reference profiles that you're seeing here, and as expected, this is most tight, highly associated with, um, with pluripotent stem cells and, and related lineages as you would expect. So with that, uh, that background, we'd like to actually just jump in and show you some ways to actually analyze your own data within the software Alt Analyze. Um, before we begin, um, I'd like you actually to go to the Alt Analyze website if you have a chance. And on that website, uh, there is a link that says sample data. And if you go to that link, that sample data link, uh, there's again videos and tutorial information here. But the data set, the data that I'm going to be playing with today is uh, the, that found in the link PSC differentiation. So if you go ahead and download that, um, and once that's downloaded, you can extract it. Um, there's a series of files inside of there um, that we're going to use in this inputs folder as our inputs for uh, our sandbox today. So first, we're going to start Alt Analyze. So how do you do that? Um, once you've downloaded Alt Analyze and extracted it to your computer, um, in this case, most users are probably going to put it on a Mac, for example, in their applications folder. On a PC, they may add it to their desktop or wherever they like. Uh, you're simply going to open that folder uh, in this case, it's again in applications, and there are uh, on my on my computer there are three folders or three files. One is a green icon that's called Alt Analyze. One is a white icon called Alt Analyze, and one ca is called Alt Analyze Viewer. Uh, since this is an application that was not developed by Apple, if you click on, for example, this green application the first time, it may say uh, this is not this this program has not been registered by Apple. Uh, do you sure it's been downloaded from the web? Are you sure you want to, to use it? It may not even give you the option to do that. If you hit control on a Mac and click uh, and then say open, it will provide you with a different option here. Uh, if your computer's never seen this before, which says, do you, are you sure you want to open it? And you can say yes. At that point, you should be, you should see a window like this here, which says Alt Analyze version two and begin analysis. If you have a problem at this point, and you're not able to open this window, you can, you can actually open up on a Mac at least, you can open up this second white icon. This actually opens the program in a slightly different way, but it results in the exact same uh, interface. I should mention that Alt Analyze uh, has both a graphical user interface and it can be run by command line. So everything I am showing you, there are command line equivalents to run it. However, Personally, I prefer to actually run it through the graphical user interface. It's much easier and more intuitive. Um, if you're having other problems, let us know during this call and we'll, we'll address your questions later on. On a PC, uh, the file should be called altanalyze.exe and it should look like this green icon. Great. Um, once you've, uh, the first time you've opened Alt Analyze, um, it will again tell you some, some special considerations for Mac operating systems. Uh, you probably don't have to worry about that too much during this but uh, this tutorial, but go back and read that later. And if you continue, if you already have a species database installed, this is something what the, the interface will look like. If you don't have a species database installed, which is typical if, the, if this is the first time you uh, started the software, uh, instead, you're going to be prompted to download a database, a species database, and then you say, OK, uh, the program is going to connect to the web and let you really select any species which you would like to download. Uh, there are various versions of Alt Analyze. Uh, each one of these databases is connected to a different genome version, and the genome versions are centered on Ensemble. They're based on Ensemble. So you need to go to the Ensemble website and see, does your genome version, for example, Ensemble 72, corresponds to HG19, um, which also corresponds to MM10, versus if we went to Ensemble 62, we're now looking at HG18 and MM9 for, for mouse. So that's impor something important to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, once you click download, it will download the basic gene database for your species. If you're, per, if you're going to be analyzing RNA sequencing data uh, from the main menu, um, you'll be, um, the, the program will ask you, say, can it download another database? And at that point you can say, yes, please, please download another database. 
in this case, I'm going to just uh, start back the main menu here. And um, I happen to have multiple databases installed, which is why it says up at the top mm -hmm. here, uh, it says there, there, what, which database you'd like to select. Um, you can have different species that you'd like to download. Um, and if you were to have RNA sequencing data, you actually can process this with various uh, methods within the software. And so AltAnalyze can actually process raw RNA sequencing data sets, data from FASTQ files. It can identify differentially expressed genes. Uh, it can perform pathway enrichment analyses automatically. Uh, I'm going to do a variety of things automatically without the user really having to intervene. Today, we're not going to do that. Today, we're actually going to focus on the downstream analyses. Um, so in this case, for simplicity, I'm not going to select RNA-seq. I'm actually going to select other ID. When I select other ID, it gives me an option down here. It's a select platform. Currently, it's set to Affymetrix. I'm going to set this to not a platform, actually, but a type of identifier, a gene identifier. So what gene identifier do I have? So to answer that, I need to go to back to my, my demo data that I was looking at, um, which I have here on my, my desktop. And in inputs here, I have uh, uh, these different folders. And so for example, if I uh, go to this uh, folder called clustering, and I look at this file folder called top differentially expressed genes, you'll notice it's a text file. It's a tab delimited text file, um, which you can easily save from Excel. Um, and that's what, uh, that's what AltAnalyze likes to see. It likes to see files with the extension .txt and that the, the columns are separated by tabs. In this case, we opened a file and this expression file has gene symbols on it. Uh, these are also known as Yugo IDs, but, but typically they're referred to as gene symbols uh, for, for both mouse and human and other species. And uh, in this case, this data set has uh, what are known as RPKM values, which is a, a measure of gene expression. Uh, and then the, the columns here are indicate different samples. In this case, these are different bulk RNA-seq samples from uh, pluripotent stem cells or differentiated projects, products, which are, are going to be our, our demo data set for today. And each row is a different gene. So we can see that our data set has gene symbols. If we close that now, we go back to Alt-Analyze. And I'm going to switch to Alt-Analyze uh, with this uh, command tab option on a Mac, uh, which is a little less buggy than other options. Uh, uh, but uh, if you then go down in this menu and you find symbol, now you're ready to go. You've told the program that the data sets that I'm going to work with have a symbol as opposed to an ensemble identifier, a RefSeq identifier, or a Unipro identifier, or a PubChem identifier. And so if you now say continue, uh, the program is now going to prompt you to either analyze expression, an expression file, similar to the file we just saw, in which case you'd probably want to perform differential expression analyses, um, or even unsupervised analyses, for example, if there's a single cell RNA sequencing data and you want to identify uh, cell populations in an automated, unsupervised way, that's an option. You also have the option to open up an interactive results viewer, which again, if you've generated results previously in Alt Analyze, this helps you navigate those results. What we're going to be doing here today is going to these additional analyses options. And some of these are some of the most powerful uh, options you can use in the program, uh, and you can use them independent of having FASTQ files or BAM files or 10x genomic input files. Uh, you can just analyze these data uh, from simple text files you've already generated from whatever analysis pipeline that you have. So if you now hit continue, you'll get this other menu here uh, that's, that gives you this uh, series of different analysis options that correspond to many of the different types of visualization methods that I talked about earlier. Uh, the first one that we're going to go to is dimensionality reduction. And then we're going to hit continue. So as I mentioned before, a form of dimensionality reduction is PCA. And so we're going to run a principal component analysis, but first we have to select an expression file. So we're going to select a file here. And here at the top, we have these different possible folders here. Um, we're going to look in this filtered expression folder. And inside this filtered expression folder, there's this uh, file called all differentially expressed genes. Actually, this is somewhat of a misnomer. This is not all differentially expressed genes. Uh, this is just poor naming on my part. This is actually all uh, expressed genes, not differentially expressed. Um, but there is some variance within those genes. So um, in some ways, they are differentially expressed. But if you select that file and you now uh, you have a series of options you can select from this menu, you could say just continue. Uh, in fact, we'll just do that. Uh, you'd, I, would, I would suggest not to hit continue like I am uh, just to save time. But in this case, what it's going to do 
is it's going to take, in this case, all 16,000 rows and 235 columns, all which are bulk RNA-seq samples, and it's going to uh, generate a PCA plot, which looks quite messy. And the reason it looks quite messy is there's symbols, uh, or actually names of the samples are associated with each one of the individual uh, samples in the data set. So we don't want that, so we're going to close this. Uh, once you close that menu, it automatically takes you back to this uh, additional analyses uh, menu. I'm going to go back to dimensionality reduction, and I'm just going to say display samples equals no. Uh, in addition to that, I often find it's easier to start with a two-dimensional representation as opposed to a three-dimensional representation of a PC plot. And that's, and that's going to, I think, help simplify the visualization of that data. So I'm going to hit continue after selecting those two different options. And again, we're going to get a principal component plot that's showing uh, much of the, the, the major variance within this data set. So in this particular case, we had a data set which was composed of uh, pluripotent stem cells, uh, either IPSCs or HE, HE, uh, uh, ESCs, uh, differentiated embryoid bodies, uh, ectoderm, RNA-seq, definitive ect endoderm, uh, and mesoderm differentiated, uh, uh, extracted at different days of differentiation. And what you can see is that there's a clear separation of these samples in space, suggesting that uh, there is, uh, you know, there, there actually these differentiation protocols were re work reasonably well, and there weren't, um, there wasn't a significant major variance between these populations. Although you can see, for example, there are now some pluripotent stem cells which actually cluster out separately from this other group. And so uh, how would we actually identify what, what variance is associated with that? Well, in this case, you can see that there's uh, the variance lies along principal component too. So you might see that some of the genes that are actually uh, most posit negatively or positively associated with principal component two are those that actually may be describing the variance. And when we run a principal component analysis in actuality, actually, um, uh, if we go back to this filtered expression folder, you can see there's now this data plots folder that's been generated. And this data plots folder actually has our PCA plots that we were generated. And so you can open up these in a program such as Adobe Acrobat and, and, and get nice uh, vector quality versions of that graph. And there's also even a, a folder here called PCA, which has a text file, which indicates um, what genes are actually associated with each of the principal components. So now you actually could go back and see what are the genes that are correlated with principal component two, PC2, or anti-correlated uh, with principal component two or other principal components, and see if those genes are actually, in some cases, showing lineage skewing within pluripotent stem cells. So by itself, this actually provides you a lot of information, this simple plot. If we again close this and go back, um, there are different options here. And one question you might have is how did we assign those different labels to those different populations. Well, in our folder here, in our filtered expression folder, we had a file with uh, expression values uh, for all, all samples, similar to the one I previously showed you. And we also have this other fo fo file here called the groups file. And as long as the file has the same name as the other file, with the other file having the prefix exp dot, as you saw, if this file has the uh, prefix groups dot, and it has these three columns which indicate uh, the sample name, a group number, and the name of the group programs, uh, methods like this PCA uh, viewer can instantly assign these different group annotations uh, to the uh, samples and color them respectively, like you saw in that principal component plot. You can actually do other things with this, with this plot too. You can actually view the expression of individual genes. So for example, I would expect to see uh, OCT, the OCT4 gene, or uh, POU5F1 for people that are not uh, necessarily uh, familiar with uh, stem cell biology. Um, but you, we enter that into enter a gene to color the PCA by. And if you do that, it's going to re render that plot again. And uh, at this time, it's going to show a gradient of gene expression uh, where the highest expression, the highest darkest red, indicates the highest expression of OCT4 and the lowest expression or no expression is actually indicated by gray here. So again, this is a nice way to, to interactively evaluate your data. And you can actually do that with more than one gene. For example, we can put other, other lineage markers in here too uh, for both uh, endoderm, nodal, PAC6 for um, 
ectoderm and get a four for uh, mesoderm. And if you do that, then uh, it's not going to show a gradient of gene expression anymore in this type of plot. But now it's going to actually show you uh, which which cells are have you know are maximally distinguished by expression of these different genes. So without even knowing anything about these samples, um, or these could be single cell RNA seq profiles, you can really mark what cell populations are likely which identity if you have a priori identified cell markers. Uh, lastly. Um, Although you can generate a 3D plot, which is nice to spin around and, and look at, um, one nice thing you can do here is you can actually store the, the genes associated with these top principal components. And these are effectively those, those genes in that text file I showed you before. And here, all this is asking for is a name. And so here I'm going to say this is a differentiation uh, PCA uh, genes. And I'm just going to hit continue again. And what the program is going to do, it's actually going to store this, uh, those genes associated with those top principal components. And so then I could use those again later and visualize those again if I wanted to later. I'm going to now close the principal component menu, and I'm going to go back to this main uh, additional analyses menu. Um, I don't think there's much confusion. I don't think we've seen many questions at this point. But if you do have questions, let us know, and we can, uh, Minakshi will stop here and, and let me know. Um, if you now go to the option hierarchical clustering and hit continue, uh, you'll notice by default it actually selects the same expression file we were looking at before, this expression file that has uh, basically all, all genes expressed. Uh, if we were to try to cluster this file, it would actually take a while because there are 15,000 rows. It might take, you know, use, depending on the clustering algorithm, it could take somewhere in the area of five minutes to an hour depending on how sophisticated the clustering algorithm is. However, we have a, a nice smaller demo expression file uh, that's available to us. And so we're going to go back to that inputs folder that we downloaded. And we're going to go to the folder clustering. So within clustering, there's a, a smaller expression file. And this has the top differentially expressed genes uh, between these different groups that we've been analyzing. I'm going to select that. And if we just hit continue, it will actually generate a um, a heat map. Uh, it says currently that it's using an algorithm called HOPAC here for the clustering. Uh, if you were on a Mac and it does not say that, the reason why is because you do not already have R installed. All that the program needs to use a more sophisticated clustering algorithm is uh, called HOPAC is that you actually have installed R from the Bioconductor website. Uh, it's not required. You don't absolutely have to do that. Uh, but it actually does provide some slicker, prettier genic, some clustering results. Uh, in this case now, we have what's called the heat map. Uh, red here indicates genes with the highest uh, relative expression and blue with the lowest relative expression. For each and every row, what's happened here is the program has looked at the median value and it subtracted the median value. Uh, it first converts these all to log two values it can subtracts the median log two value from each value to get effectively a, a fold change. So here indicates up regulation and blue indicates down regulation. You're welcome to turn that option off. You don't have to normalize uh, the based on median expression each row, but often this helps highlight maximal gene expression changes. And so already you can see there are different uh, populations of, of samples here. And below this actually gives us an indication of what these different samples are. So for example, here the red samples are definitive endoderm, the orange are uh, embryoid bodies, um, actually sorry, the, 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 the yellowish orange are embryoid bodies, uh, these are mesoderm, uh, the pluripotent stem cells, iPSCs are this lime green, and this other green are embryonic stem cells. Uh, and there's actually, unfortunately, two greens here, which look very similar. So this is a caveat for having lots of groups like we have here. Um, once you obtain a heat map like this, you actually, there's an option here at the bottom which says open heat map in Trivium. And if you have Java installed, um, Alt Analyze automatically comes with a program called uh, Treeview, Java Treeview, which has been previously described by uh, and is developed by other, other an, another group. Uh, and you can actually interactively now navigate the genes within this heat map. Um, so we can look, for example, in this cluster over here and see, okay, we're going to 
uh, scroll over here and see that this appears to be a, dominated by Hox genes. Uh, hand one and hand two. Uh, these happen to be embryoid bodies. You can see up here up at the top. And so what we see is probably the induction of, of something analogous to maybe a cardiac program, a cardiac differentiation program within these cells. Um, so this is one way to, to analyze your data. Um, I mentioned, didn't mention here at the top, these are the clusters assigned, in this case, by the HOPAC clustering algorithm. There are a lot of different clusters that it assigned. Um, if we now close this and close this other black window here, it's going to return us to the main menu. Uh, if we go back to hierarchical clustering at this point, we can actually change different things here in terms of how we view and analyze the data. I mentioned there's this algorithm called HOPAC. If you use the option select row clustering method, you can change this to HOPAC. Um, we may even want to switch this, our clustering algorithm from cosine, just a distance metric, from cosine to Euclidean, which is going to give us somewhat different results. And we may even want to change the color of the plot we're looking at. So if you change a color scheme, you could select yellow, black, blue. Um, and we can also change the intensity of the, of the, the colors that we're seeing. So there's a contrast option. And for example, I'm going to set this to I'm going to decrease the contrast a little bit, which is going to highlight more subtle gene expression changes. I'm going to change that to uh, two. If I hit continue, it's going to recluster that uh, data set, and it's going to give me a new heat map, which is now no longer red and blue, black and blue, but is now uh, yellow, black, and blue. Uh, and there's a variety of different color options and gradients there that you can use. Um, in general, the COPAC clustering algorithm that I use, is, I'm using is, it takes a little bit longer to run. I have about 16 gigabytes on this machine, which is plenty to do this kind of analysis for a data set of, a, for example, several thousand cells and several thousand genes, although it can take a little while. And you actually see you get much prettier, prettier um, more discrete clustering of these, um, these different gene sets now with this different algorithm. Uh, again, you can click on this button and view these genes. Uh, and in fact, when you do that, it's going uh, to uh, let you potentially even see some finer organization of this gene expression. Uh, for example, these are genes that are unique to red blood cells here relative to these other samples that we, we obtained from a uh, prior analysis in the software Alt Analyze using uh, the, the full workflow that we're not going through today. Um, uh, you can also do a number of uh, advanced things with these views. Um, and so uh, I think these advanced options are actually quite useful and uh, actually provide a lot of uh, useful analytical context to this method. So once you come back to this menu, it's important to note that all the options you previously had are automatically selected, so you don't have to select new options. Before, uh, I mentioned that we actually had um, selected, uh, we had the software pick out genes that were associated with the principal components. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back and not select this smaller expression file that we had before. And I should also note that in the same folder, this clustering folder, all these data plots and text files that correspond to the data plots have been saved. And so you actually have publication quality images now that you can have that are in this folder, PDF files that you can go back and access. Um, but in this case, we're going to go back to inputs, and we're going to go to the filtered expression file with, uh, with all the 15,000 genes expressed, which I said would be take a long time to cluster. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to do go down to select gene set ontology to filter. And in this case, we have a number of categories. I, I have a few more categories than you do um, because I've been playing with my software for a much longer amount of time and adding different gene types of gene sets to it. But you have CAG and Wiki Pathways. Um, you have uh, these biomarkers, which are cell type specific markers that are provided in the software that we've, uh, we've pre-compiled. Um, you have uh, putative transcription factor target relationships, uh, which, which transcription, if you select a transcription factor, what are the genes that are predicted to be regulated? Gene ontology, disease ontology, molecular phenotology, ontology, uh, and many others. In this case, I'm going to select something called stored gene sets. And stored gene set has all these prior analyses that I've run uh, with PCA and other things um, in the software. In this case, I think I called this uh, differentiation PCA genes. So I select differentiation PCA genes, 
And now um, I would normally hit continue. And it's going to actually, and actually I'll do that. I'm just going to hit continue. And it's going to actually now, rather than cluster all 15,000 genes, it's going to specifically use the genes that were pulled out by the principal component analysis as being most variable and associated with different populations as a way effectively to, uh, this is a, effectively an unsupervised analysis to look at the major gene expression trends within your data set. So most users find this particularly useful. It's a quick way to really identify what are the major forms of variance within your gene expression data set uh, and, and understand what the, the major biology is that, that separate out different cells or samples. Um, so here we are, and these are different new genes now that were defined by the principal component analysis. Um, and as you can see here at the top, these genes are largely clustering the samples based on their known uh, uh, lineage that they, they correspond to. For example, mesoderm day five samples are clustered out separately here, along with definitive endoderm samples. And we do see some differences. Uh, we see the definitive endoderm gene expression is higher for this cluster versus uh, mesoderm expression is higher in this cluster, although it looks like there's a gradient of basically similarity between these samples. Uh, you can see that the embryoid body samples are largely clustering together well, and that the pluripotent stem cells, again, are largely clustering together, as you would expect. So this analysis is, is, is a nice way to really understand what the major biology is. Again, you can view what the genes are that are associated with these, these different sets are. Um, uh, and to really understand the biology in a deeper way, there's a few more things we can do. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, select, uh, in terms of display only selected genes, I'm gonna type some genes of interest since I know this is, uh, these are stem cells uh, and I can type a number of, of stem cell associated genes uh, that we, we previously looked at. Um, got a four, um, TX5, let's say MKX25. Um, and let's say Brachiri. Question. Oh, we have a question here. Yes, we don't have store gene sets option. How do we add that? So the store gene set option should be added when you uh, you enter the name for the principal component uh, and when you're, when you're doing the PCA analysis. If it doesn't show up, it can indicate a permissions issue on that machine. So for example, if you may not have sort of permission to start to modify certain directories on the computer, it is possible that that's an issue if that's the case. Uh, you can just email us and there are certain workarounds for that. Um, so here we're going to display certain genes. Um, and then we're also going to go to this option down here which says perform gene set cluster enrichment. And so if we select this option, and in this case there's lots of different categories we can choose. I'm gonna choose uh, wiki pathways in this case, although you can really pick whatever you want. Um, it's going to do a gene set enrichment analysis on the left-hand side of this heat map um, to highlight what are the biological pathways that are associated with the genes within that cluster. So now I'm going to hit continue. Again, it's going to repeat the analysis we just uh, performed a moment ago. It's going to take all 15,000 genes. It's going to select those genes that were associated with the top principal components. Um, and then it's going to... Uh, uh, it's then going to cluster those results using the HOPAC algorithm, using the Euclidean metric. Um, and once it generates those clustered results, it's going to uh, search for the genes that we entered to display on the right-hand side of the heat map. And finally, it's going to perform this pathway or gene set enrichment analysis, uh, which you can see from this, this uh, status view is going on in the background. And so the particular pathway analysis that it's running is a method called GoElite. Uh, you could actually run a GoElite analysis on files in the uh, filtered expression, uh, or actually, sorry, the um, in this demo, demo folder that we provided. Um, when you run a pathway analysis, it, it does a bit of overkill, and it actually generates networks for each and every gene network, gene to pathway networks for each and every uh, cluster. And it even pops up this window here uh, that, that gives you a file with the pathway enrichment analysis results. And if you were to open this file in Excel, 
it says what genes are associated with their different clusters, uh, which you can see here on the right. Uh, you can see the clusters they're associated with on the left and how many genes were associated with that particular pathway. Um, so this is a nice way to do, uh, you know, look at multiple different types of gene sets from a large data set simultaneously. Within the actual heat map itself, you have access to the same information effectively. So for example, uh, for uh, this cluster of genes that's associated with embryoid bodies, um, these were largely associated with, with TGF-beta signaling genes. If you now select TGF-beta, uh, it shows you the specific genes that were regulated, and it actually copies these to your clipboard. So if you were now to go back to Excel, for example, and hit paste, it automatically will paste those genes that you were, were looking at in that window you just opened. If you close this, a little network appears, and this network is really showing you the genes that were associated with pathways, wiki pathways in particular, in this cluster of genes, um, and how these are associated with different uh, uh, with each other in different biological processes. So this really gives you a powerful way to start interpreting your data. Uh, in this case, there was only OCK4 was the only gene, the one that I'd, I'd entered manually that happened to be there. Uh, but if you click on OCK4 or POW, 5F1, you can now get additional information in this gene cards database about this gene. So it is effectively a way to analyze your data and understand your data in a, a deeper way. There's one more way you can analyze these data, which is particularly useful, um, which is you can perform a supervised analysis. And what I mean by that is you tell the program exactly what genes you want it to supervise on to generate the clustering. And so in this case, I'm going to select off of the stored gene sets that we have before. I'm going to say none selected. You don't worry about that this has something. It's, it's not going to use that. And I'm going to select here some genes to get the, the most correlated genes to. And again, I'm going to actually top, type in a few genes that I know are of particular interest. So uh, POWF1 and let's uh, say PAC6. Down here, it says get all gene correlated genes with a row greater than. A row is a Pearson correlation coefficient, and those values range from negative one to positive one. And so in this case, I'm going to list a value of 0.3. Actually, I'll list a value of 0.4. Um, and in this case, to save time, uh, I'm going to say no none selected for the wiki pathways option for the gene set enrichment. And so in this case, it's now going to go through all the 15, 16,000 genes that we looked at. It's going to perform all pairwise comparisons uh, of, uh, to basically find the, which genes are correlated to those, those few genes, that, those two genes that we entered. Uh, and it's now going to make a new heat map based on only these 539 genes that it was correlated to, um, to give you some uh, uh, results that are now supervised. Uh, so you can see what genes are specifically correlated and maybe transcriptionally. So transcriptionally co-regulated with these genes may uh, either represent downstream targets if, if the genes we inserted are transcription factors, which they are in this case, um, or genes that are co-regulated because they are regulated by some upstream factor. So uh, this is a useful way to really see how many genes are associated with a particular query gene of interest and uh, if, if these genes are basically master, potentially master control elements within a particular uh, set of data. So I'm now going to close uh, the hierarchical clustering. I'm going to go back to the main menu. And with the remaining time we have, I'm going to quickly show you two other, um, two other options in this program. The first is pathway visualization. So if we go to pathway visualization, and we now, this is human data, so I'm going to select human. And when I select human, the program is actually going to go out to the WikiPathways web server and say, what are the latest and greatest WikiPathways that are available? And it's going to populate these down here. And so now I can uh, select any pathway of interest. Before I do that, I'm going to actually select a text file which contains genes um, that are differentially expressed, which I want to view on that pathway. And those differentially expressed genes can be found in this folder, uh, result folder that we have, this input file folder that we have. Uh, so if we go to uh, network and pathway, in this case, we'll look at, um, let's see a good example here. Uh, we'll look at the Wnt signaling pathway. 
Um, and so with wind signaling, we'll look at uh, ectoderms. So here are genes, di differentially expressed genes from ectoderm versus pluripotent stem cells. And if you look at this file, uh, it has four columns uh, in this text file. The first is gene symbols. The next is what we call a system code, uh, which indicates that these are symbols as opposed to ensemble IDs. Um, this, is, this column is not required, but the pro it helps the program identify what is the type of identifier that you're using. Um, if you want to know which, what the system codes are in this examples data set link, there's an, a link here that takes you to a page that shows you all the system codes for different, uh, for different identifiers. Uh, and then the next column is actually the fold change. And the fold change is used to actually color gene expression on the pathway. So again, so we're going to go to network biology and we're going to go select ectoderm. Uh, I'm going to actually select a pathway that I, I previously saw that was of particular interest, which is wind signaling. So we'll go down to the bottom here. Uh, wind signaling. Oh, where is it? So there's wind. Is that the right one? Yes, wind signaling pathway and pluripotency. We'll select that one and we'll say display uh, pathway. Now in the background here, it's actually useful to show um, there's a folder that's been created called Wiki Pathways. And in that folder, there's going to be populated uh, these image files. And so we just saw one new image file appear, um, which is a PDF. And now we saw PNG appear. And in the program then, uh, you're going to see the genes that were differentially expressed, in this case, the ones that are upregulated are colored in red. Uh, the more intensely they're upregulated, the, the more intense red they are. Uh, the genes that are downregulated are blue. So in this case, you see in ectoderm differentiation, the gene expression data is suggesting that there's a large increase in wind signaling um, that's acting through these frizzled receptors uh, that's potentially acting on uh, this gene LEF1 downstream of beta-catenin. Uh, left this TCF left one complex is a transcriptional repressor, and this this results in downregulation potentially of these different factors, these core pluripotency genes, likely to shut down pluripotency and induce differenti a differentiation program in this term in this particular case ectoder uh, ecto ectodermal formation. So pathways really give you a higher context understanding of biology um, that you couldn't obtain from. Uh, from a gene set enrichment like gene ontology analysis by itself. Uh, and there are such, other such examples here in this folder uh, that you can look at with different types of pathways. For example, here we have a mesoderm commitment pathway, which is when I ran this previously before this, uh, before we went online here, uh, which shows kind of a, a network representation that's been converted into a pathway uh, from an earlier analysis of similar data. To look at which genes are upregulated and down downregulated in a pathway associated with mesodermal specification. So Wiki Pathways really has diverse pathways, and you can actually go to the Wiki Pathways website and you can contribute your own pathways using uh, open source available tools. Um, the final analysis I'd like to show you is a network analysis. So if you go to network analysis, network visualization in this menu. You can actually start to just type in genes to build a network from. So I'm going to start to view, uh, build a simple network with some of these genes that we were looking at before. Uh, these are core pluripotency genes um, that, uh, that have been well studied within the, the literature. Um, and we can sign some uh, T253 and I'll say uh, TCF7L1 uh, to see if this can give us a small network. And so before we hit go on this, there's a few things we need to do. Uh, first, we have to say where we're saving these results to. In this case, we'll save them to this uh, network pathway folder. And then we also have to tell it what types of interaction databases it should look at. So it here says select one or more interaction databases. So by default, it's just going to use pathway interactions from a Wookie Pathways database, but we want to use more. So we're going to select KEG. We're looking to get, look at putative transcriptional transcription factor targets, and putative protein-protein interactions from a database called BioGrid. So we hit continue on that, and the program is going to look for interactions between the small number of genes that we input, and it's going to give us these various different colored lines, which actually propose an interesting regulatory network in this case, 
Red lines in this context indicate, as I mentioned before, putative transcriptional regulatory activities. So in this case, it appears that KLF4 may be upstream of uh, P53 and NANOG. NANOG uh, appears to be uh, in a uh, cyclical relationship regulating uh, OC4, SOX2, which all regulate each other, whereas TCF1 interacts with um, uh, MIC and NANOG uh, where at NTP53 and, and NANOG uh, regulate each other's transcription. So, uh, so that's useful by itself, but you can now actually visualize data on top of that. So if we go back to this, uh, this network analysis menu, again, by default, it will have selected all the uh, options that we previously had before. You can select an expression file from which to, to visualize data on. So now I'm going to look at uh, pluripotent stem cells versus embryo bodies. So pluripotent stem cells are in the numerator and embryo bodies are in the denominator. And it's going to do two things here. It's going to first, it's going to actually visualize genes from those original genes that we had on there in the network. But you're actually going to see a much larger network appear now. And what happened here is by default, what the program does is it expands this list of interactions, the gene interactions to those any genes that are indirectly interacting with the genes in that network that we generated are also going to be displayed here. So we see our hub genes that we initially input, like P53, NANOG, OC4, and SOX2. And now we see all these putative transcriptional targets of SOX2, NANOG, OC4, MIC, and P53 that were transcriptionally regulated in that comparison we have. So already we're able to obtain somewhat of a higher order understanding of some potential biology based only on interactions that are present within this database. Again, as red is upregulated and blue is downregulated. We can also build interactions without having candidate lists of genes like these. Uh, there are different ways we can do this. One way, which I'm not gonna show you right this moment, is you can actually select uh, pathways. So you can select, for example, uh, something from the gene ontology. So from the gene ontology, we might select apoptosis terms and look for generate a network uh, from the gene ontology of apoptosis terms. Instead of that, what we're going to do is we're going to actually generate a network from our gene expression file. And in this case, we're going to select uh, PC, uh, actually I'm going to select definitive endoderm versus uh, PSC. And then we're going to, um, uh, we're going to generate a network based on these interactions uh, as opposed to others. Uh, now, I think that the interaction network is going to be quite large in this case, so I'm going to make it a little smaller. Uh, so I'm going to restrict it to wiki pathways and transcription factor targets. So if I hit continue, uh, now we're going to get a new network, uh, hopefully not too large of a network. Up, oh, it's too large. Uh, 615 uh, 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 edges, so, so quite large. But again, you now have uh, again, a potential regulatory network in which involves regulatory interactions and even pathway-based interactions that underlie this data. And so you can play with those options and which databases you're using, what interaction types to really, uh, uh, you know, make new network representations. Um, and, and we and others have used uh, this network analysis tool uh, to generate published results in, for, for a number of different studies. Uh, we're actually out of time. Uh, so I want to give uh, you, and it's people a little bit of time to ask questions. I don't think there were additional questions. Um, but if not, what I'll just like to say is that uh, if you have further questions and you'd like to ask them, uh, there are a number of actually of visualization options which we did not co cover today, uh, such as Venn diagram generation, which, which only takes a moment. But you can merge files. You can either take the union uh, of different files or the intersection of different files. There are advanced methods for splicing visualization. Uh, you can translate identifiers from one ID system to another in this menu. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you can predict the likely cell composition of samples, which includes samples which may have many different cell types, uh, many different lineages present. Um, but with that, I'm just going to, to end this and let you know that uh, if you have further questions, to please go to our website. Um, and once you're at our website, uh, you can simply contact us. You can either post things, uh, comments through our user groups. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have these online tutorials, including uh, video tutorials uh, that walk through how you perform 
uh, these analyses and other analyses, including how to analyze FASTQ files directly from both bulk and single cell RNA-seq, and perform unsupervised analyses uh, to identify cell populations from your single cell RNA-seq. Um, so thank you very much, and I was uh, uh, happy to do this again if you uh, were interested in uh, hearing about more things. I think we might have, we have, nope, yep. So I think we are good. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, so I'm just going to give the end of my my advertisement for the next webinar. Um, so please fill out the evaluation form at the end of the webinar when you receive it in a subsequent email, and let us know what you thought of today's webinar and any topics you might want to see in a future NAVBO presentation. Tune into our next webinar on November 8th when Ann Eichmann will be presenting the recent science paper from her lab at the Cardiovascular Research Center at Yale entitled Lacteal Junction Zippering Protects Against Diet-Induced Obesity. Thank you and sure to tune in next week or next month. <laughs>